Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ruff, approximately how many Canadians have applied for a secret security clearance or otherwise have a secret security clearance at the present time? Do you have any statistics in that? On, on yeah, look, that? I, I, I asked another OPQ that somebody might have signed off in the room um, in the last little while. Um, in the last decade, there's been approximately 250,000 secret security clearances applied for uh, across government departments. Uh, obviously, it's not that large, that's, but that's over a decade time frame. Know how many were denied out of those 250,000 approximately applications for secret security clearance? A lot. 23. Whoa. 23 <laughs> at the secret level. Wow. Two, All right. So 200. 50,000 applications in the last decade, and yet, as it presently stands, a, a sitting member of parliament, uh, putting aside being in cabinet, being a parliamentary secretary, uh, having uh, a clearance from a previous career, uh, is shut out. I mean, it seems passing strange. It, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, having regard for the fact that parliamentarians uh, a core function is to hold the government to account on matters of, of national security, foreign policy, national defense, and so on, public safety. And uh, how, is it, how does it make sense that 250,000 Canadians have secret security clearances, but if I, as a member of parliament, applied, I'd almost certainly be turned down? That's, a good that's why Bill C-377 has been tabled, Mr. Cooper. And uh, you noted in your testimony that a key recommendation of this committee's report on the question of privilege concerning MP Michael Chong and other members arising from the government's failure to inform them they, they and their families were being targeted by the Beijing regime uh, provided, and I'll, I'll just read into the record, the recommendation, uh, quote, that the government work with recognized parties' whips to facilitate security clearances at secret level or higher to ensure that they be adequately briefed about important national security matters. Uh, uh, that effectively is what your bill would enshrine, correct? As, as, at least, get, I, I guess to be clear, the first step of that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, this committee has already unanimously made a recommendation that goes much further than what my bill actually achieves. My bill just allows parliamentarians to apply for a secret security clearance. It doesn't garner access. You've actually, as a committee, have already unanimously passed that you feel certain committees need not only to have a clearance, need to have a higher than secret level clearance. That's a lot, you know, but that's what you guys determined here. Um, and that then you actually get the information and get briefed on it for certain committees. I, I, again, I, I do not, I wholly support that recommendation that the PROC committees made. My bill doesn't actually go that far. Hmm. Second reading debate on your bill. The parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Public Safety said the following with respect to your bill. Quote, it does not address what information they, as in members of parliament and senators, would be looking for, where they would access it physically, how they would maintain it, and on this ad hoc basis, what would actually come of it. End of quote. Don't those arguments from the parliamentary secretary entirely miss the objective of your bill? It does. It, it goes to the next step. But in, in, it, again, my bill only addresses the right and privilege of parliamentarians to apply for se uh, secret security clearance. It doesn't. It's, it's valid concerns about once a committee's decided, it's no different if it was PROC here that says, you know what, we're studying, we want to, Here's, here's actually a potential study for this committee. How, you know, maybe it's more for BOIE, is, all right, should a committee have all their members appropriately cleared and we decide that Parliament, uh, you know, Parliament decides going forward to the next step that we need to be doing much more studies out of more classified nature, how do you address the resources and how do you, you know, because then it, it comes down. And, and, and a point that I want to go to when I was in the military, my previous last job before I went to Iraq was handling joint training for the for for the whole Canadian Armed Forces. I put together a consequent management exercise working with the Government Ops Center and Public Safety, 47 different government departments and agencies involved in that. 
in dealing with an improvised nuclear device having gone off in Peggy's Cove, and then how do you deal with that? And again, not a D&D lead or a CAF lead, but we know is the force of last resort. One of the huge challenges that we identified, and this is all unclassified, is the lack of infrastructure and the lack of even government bureaucracies, people with the appropriate clearance right across this country at the other levels of government. How many people in a hospital have a secret level clearance or access to secret level information that if a terrorist threat was coming down the pipe and that you may want to be prepared to deal with the consequences of it, where does that happen? So there, I mean, I can go on forever about the challenges and some of the necessary infrastructure and investment that needs to be put into uh, the ability to share classified information. But again, it's a step past my bill. This guy sounds like he Thank knows his you, stuff. Thank uh, you very much, Mr. Cooper.